Hi guys, welcome to this video on Act 3, Scene 1, from Macbeth. And in this scene, we're going to see Macbeth and Banquo having a conversation as Banquo is trying to get out of Macbeth's castle. This is a really tense conversation as Banquo now fully suspects that Macbeth was the person that murdered Duncan and has some reservations that Macbeth is going to try to murder him. In this way, the scene shows the breakdown of Macbeth and Banquo's friendship, linking in with Macbeth's corruption and his change. You know, he's becoming more paranoid, more violent, uh, more worried about consolidating the power of the crown. Uh, this scene also explores the ideas of gender and masculinity, and we'll see Macbeth using some of the techniques that Lady Macbeth used to try and manipulate him, when he tries to manipulate some murderers to go and kill Banquo. And this scene also explores the idea of unchecked ambition. You know, the idea that Macbeth's ambition has no limits and has no one to really rein in the worst impulses of him as a king. But before we go through the annotation, let's have a listen to the scene. Thou hast it now, King Cordor. Alarms. All as the weird women promised. And I fear thou playedst most foully for it. Yet it was said it should not stand in thy posterity, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. If there come truth from them, as upon thee, Macbeth, their speeches shine. Why? By the verities on thee made good. May they not be my oracles as well, and set me up in hope. Hush no more. Here's our chief guest. If he had been forgotten, it had been as a gap in our great feast and all thing unbecoming. Tonight we hold a solemn supper, sir, and I request your presence. Let your highness command upon me. To the which my duties are with a most indissoluble tie for ever knit. Ride you this afternoon. Aye, my good lord. I should have else desired your good advice at this day's council. But we'll take tomorrow. Is it far, you're right? As far, my lord, as will fill up the time twixt now and supper. Go not my horse, the better I must become a borrower of the night for a dark hour or twain. Fail not our feast. My lord, I will not. We hear our bloody cousins are bestowed in England and in Ireland, not confessing their cruel parricide, filling their hearers with strange invention. But of that tomorrow, when therewithal we shall have course of state craving us jointly. Hire you to horse. Adieu till you return at night. Go Spleance with you. Aye, my good lord. Our time does call upon us. I wish your horses swift and short of foot, and so I do commend you to their backs. Farewell. Let every man be master of his time till seven at night. To make society the sweeter welcome, we'll keep ourselves till supper time alone. Well, then, God be with you. Sir, a word with you. Attend those men, our pleasure. They are, my lord, without the palace gate. Bring them before us. To be thus is nothing. But to be safely thus. Our fears in Banquo stick deep. And in his royalty of nature reigns that which will be feared. It is much he dares. And to that dauntless temper of his mind he hath a wisdom that doth guide his valour to act in safety. There is none but he whose being I do fear. And under him my genius is rebuked, as it is said Mark Antony's was by Caesar. He chid the sisters when first they put the name of king upon me and bade them speak to him. Then, prophet-like, they hailed him father to a line of kings. Upon my head they placed a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my grip, thence to be wrenched by an unlineal hand, no son of mine succeeding. If it be so, for Banquo's issue have I filed my mind. For them, the gracious Duncan, have I murdered. 
put rancors in the vessel of my peace only for them and mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man to make them kings. The seed of Banquo kings? Rather than so come fate into the list and champion me to the utterance. Who's that? Now go to the door and stay there till we call. Was it not yesterday we spoke together? It was, so please, Your Highness. Well, then, now, have you considered of my speeches? No, that it was he in the times past who held you so under fortune who you thought had been our innocent self. This I made good to you at our last conference. Passed in probation with you how you were born in hand how crossed the instruments, who wrought with them, and all things else which might to half a soul and to a notion crazed say, thus did Banquo. You made it known to us. I did, sir. And went further, which is now our point of second meeting. Do you find your patience so predominant in your nature that you can let this go? Are you so gospel to pray for this good man and for his issue, whose heavy hand hath bowed you to the grave and beggared yours forever? We are men, my liege. Aye, in the catalogue, you go for men. As hounds and greyhounds, mongrels, spaniels, curs, shuffs, water rugs, and demi wolves are clapped all by the name of dogs. The valued file distinguishes the swift, the slow. The subtle, the housekeeper, the hunter, every one according to that gift which bounteous nature hath in him closed, whereby he does receive particular addition from the bill that writes them all alike. And so of men. Huh? No. If you have a station in the file, not in the worst rank of manhood, Say it, and I will put that business in your bosoms, whose execution takes your enemy off. I am one, my liege, whom the vile blows and buffets of the world have so incensed that I'm reckless what I do, despite the world. No, another. Both of you know Banquo was your enemy. Well, true, my lord. So is he mine. And in such bloody distance that every minute of his being thrusts against my nearest of life. And though I could with barefaced power sweep him from my sight and bid my will avouch it, yet I must not for certain friends who are both his and mine, whose loves I may not drop, but wail his fall who I myself struck down. And thence it is that I to your assistance do make love, masking the business from the common eye for sundry weighty reasons. We will, my lord, perform what you command us. Though our lives Your spirits that. shine through you. Within this hour, at most, I will acquaint you where to plant yourselves, advise you of the perfect spy of the time, the moment on it, for it must be done tonight, and something from the palace. Always thought that I require a clearness. And with him to leave no rubs nor botches in the work, Fleance, his son, who keeps him company, whose absence is no less material to me than is his father's, must embrace the fate of that dark hour. Resolve yourselves apart. I'll come to you anon. We are resolved, my lord. I'll call upon you straight. It is concluded. Abide within. Banquo, thy soul's flight, if it find heaven, must find it out tonight. Okay, let's start looking at some of this annotation then. Uh, and as I said before, this scene shows the breakdown of Macbeth and Banquo's friendship. This is the point where Macbeth is too full of jealousy uh, and too full of paranoia about Banquo's prophecy to allow him to live. And so he contacts two murderers and discusses them a plot by which they will murder Banquo. Uh, this 
is another level of Macbeth's corruption. Not just the fact that he is willing to kill his friend, but consider how he murders. And I've said this about Macbeth murdering in a couple of the other scenes, but it's progressively getting worse. The last murder he committed was Duncan and the Guards. This murder, he is now hiring two assassins to go out and take out Banquo for him. This is a very, very dishonourable murder now. Now, now, just to point out, unchecked ambition, the definition will be ambition that is unchallenged by other people, consequences, practicalities or morality. Very much Macbeth is in a position now where his ambition is allowed to go completely unchecked. He's the king. Nobody can challenge him anymore. And so he can do anything that he wants, including planning to murder his friend. So this scene starts with Banquo talking about his concerns around Macbeth. And he talks about the witches, saying, Thou hast it now, King, Cordor, Glams, all, as the weird women promised. So, so he is just reflecting that the prophecies have all come true. And he says, I fear thou playst most foully for it. This is an echo of the witches' fairies foul. You know, he is recognising that Macbeth has done something really bad to become king. And uh, by echoing the words of Lady Macbeth and the witches, Banquo shows his suspicion. And those words Lady Macbeth uses are, wouldst not play false. So by talking in this way, it shows that Banquo understands that there is possibly treason that has happened. Um, he then uses some natural imagery, um, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. Uh, this indicates that the reign that will come from Banquo would be right, it would be sanctioned by God. It also links with the imagery that Duncan uses when talking about planting them and growing seeds into, into, into great men, that, that Banquo believes that his line of kings will be good. Uh, and then finally within this little speech, Banquo asks of, of the witches, may they not be my oracles as well and set me up in hope? Now, in this way, the witches are also equivocating with Banquo. You know, they are hiding elements of the truth from Banquo when they say to him, you know, um, although you won't be king, you will father a line of kings. And the piece of information that they don't include is that Banquo won't be king because he's going to be murdered by Macbeth. You know, by withholding information, that is a form of equivocation that they use on Banquo. So then Macbeth and all of his attendants come in and there's this really, really awkward conversation between Macbeth and Banquo. I'm just going to touch on a few points here. So the first, solemn supper, sir. We have sibilant sounds there, uh, sibilance foreshadowing betrayal. Uh, and now Banquo, when asked if he's going to be attending the supper, responds with, let your highness command upon me to the which my duties are with the most indissoluble tie forever knit. Now here, Banquo is trying to deceive Macbeth. He is trying to equivocate with Macbeth to avoid telling him where he's going, what he's doing, because he's worried that if he does tell him those things, Macbeth is going to have him killed. And the clothing reference here to knitting, if something is knitted, just a point, knitting can be undone. You know, you can unpick a piece of knitting. And so by saying that he is knitted with Macbeth rather than joined to Macbeth or stitched on to Macbeth or any other clothing illusion, I wonder if there is some symbolism behind Banquo maybe wanting out. You know, that, that knitting can be undone, knitting can be unstitched. Okay, now as we go through this, consider how Banquo is trying to block Macbeth's questions. And why does he do this? And why does he use equivocation for this? So Macbeth asks him, ride you this afternoon? I, my good lord. And he's not giving him any detail here. Macbeth says, we should have else desired your good advice, which still hath been both grave and prosperous. Grave there, foreshadowing Banquo's death. And then he says, but we'll take tomorrow. Now, tomorrow is another motif linked with time. Uh, we'll see this word crop up quite a lot. We've already seen it crop up a little bit. And tomorrow, remember, is this kind of vague, non-existent time that just never really comes around. This this point in the future that, that isn't necessarily real. So tomorrow, and Macbeth knows that for Banquo, there won't really be a tomorrow because he's going to die. So Macbeth asks, how far will he ride? 
Banquo then is, is more ambiguous. He says, as far, my lord, as will fill up the time, twixt this and supper. So, again, he's not telling him the distance he's got to go. He's not telling him the place he's got to go. He's being incredibly ambiguous. And, and he talks about how he must become a borrower of the night to get to where he needs to go. So this is the idea that he will ride through the night. And I think that this shows, you know, somewhat Banquo's fear that he's prepared to just keep going and going and going to try and get as far away from Macbeth Castle as possible. Then Macbeth, fail not our feast, just to note the fricative sounds, the F sounds, this indicates friction, this may be around the friction in their friendship. We then have some propaganda. Macbeth talks about we hear our bloody cousins, You're referring to Malcolm and Donald Bain. There is some irony within this propaganda, obviously, because Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, they were bloody, they are bloody, and we're going to see blood featured more and more and more with their characters. But, but, but by referring to them in this way, he is establishing their guilt within the court, you know, without even really having to prove anything. And he talks about their treason, that they are filling their hearers with strange invention. Maybe they're talking in court about Macbeth as a possible murder, or that there was something fishy, you know, about Macbeth's response. Uh, and then, but of that, tomorrow. So again, this is that motif. This is that vague time. And this is the idea, as I've said before, that Macbeth understands that Banquo won't be seeing any tomorrows, you know. He then asks, goes fluence with you. So this shows Macbeth is trying to get as much information about Banquo as possible. Banquo also must understand that his son is in danger. He's aware of the prophecy that his children will father a line of kings. Uh, and then he dismisses Banquo and just after makes this statement. Let every man be master of his time. And there again, there is some irony within this. This statement, he's saying that every man should be as free to do what they want as possible. But Macbeth himself isn't free. The witches are manipulating him. You know, he's been manipulated by their prophecies, by their equivocation. Uh, and certainly he doesn't believe that for Banquo. You know, he's going to go and murder him. Linking with the idea of Macbeth's unchecked ambition. That he doesn't have to worry anymore about what he does because he's the guy in charge. And we then have further sibilant sounds throughout this. Till seven at night to make society the sweeter. Um, and so on and so on and so on. Okay, we then have a soliloquy from Macbeth, which outlines all of his concerns and all of his fears, and kind of tries to justify what he's doing with Banquo. You know, because above all things, Macbeth fears losing his crown to Banquo's children. This results in further corruption of Macbeth, paranoia, greed, uh, and links with the ideas around Macbeth's unchecked ambition. So Macbeth says, to be thus is nothing but to be safely thus. Okay, he says here, I must be king in safety, you know. He understands that while there is still a threat to his crown, then he isn't safe as king. Um, he talks about Banquo, fears in Banquo's stick deep. Stick, linking to the idea of knife wounds, foreshadowing Banquo's death. Uh, and then he says that Banquo, and in his royalty of nature, reigns that which would be feared. So, so Macbeth sees Banquo as a good person. He talks about having royalty in his nature. He backs this up by saying he hath a wisdom that doth guide his valour to act in safety. So he has wisdom, he has valour, he wants to keep things safe. So Macbeth here recognises that Banquo would be a good king. You know, he's saying he would be a good king. Uh, there is none but he whose being I do fear. This links back to the previous scene. Do you remember where the old man talks about uh, someone that could make friends of foes? Macbeth here is inverting that. He's making foes of his friends. He's saying that he is scared, that he fears his best friend in the whole world. You know? Okay, here we have a literary allusion to Julius Caesar, another Shakespeare play, uh, where Mark Antony represents Macbeth and Julius Caesar represents Banquo. So it was said, as it says here, Mark Antony was told by a soothsayer that his guiding spirit was not powerful enough to oppose that of Octavius. So Macbeth feels that he doesn't have the power to oppose Banquo, even though he is the king. 
which is a very, very odd situation. And I think shows the corruption of Macbeth and the loss of his mental faculties, you know, his inability to see things what they actually are. We then have some references to Macbeth as an insecure king. He says that the witches upon my head, they placed a fruitless crown, meaning that there is no children, you know, to, to be no children, and put a barren scepter in my grip. Again, the barren scepter, this is that there is no one to continue his line of kings. And this also shows that Macbeth is fully giving in to fate and the witch's prophecies. You know, by saying that they placed a fruitless crown and that they put a barren scepter in my grip, he's showing that he believes that the witches are responsible for the situation and he accepts the power that they have. This is a dangerous situation for Macbeth, particularly in a Christian country, because this is him now talking about devil worship and that devil worship and those kind of things are the guiding forces within his life. So much, much more corruption on Macbeth. OK, unlineal. Uh, I've, I've, this is incorrect annotation here, actually. I think the unlineal hand here that he's talking about is that Banquo's hand is illegitimate, that Banquo doesn't necessarily have a claim to the throne. So thence to be wrenched with an unlineal hand, no son of mine succeeding. So Banquo's hand is the unlineal hand. So then he talks about the fact that he's going over it and thinking over it so much. For Banquo's issue have I filled my mind. He cannot stop thinking about Banquo. So for them, the gracious Duncan have I murdered. This shows that Macbeth is really committing these crimes now for the witches. And that he feels a duty to them and a loyalty to them. Which, again, is a very dangerous situation for somebody in a Christian country. Um, put rancors in the vessel of my peace. So this is saying that he is disturbed. I think that that relates to him not being able to sleep. And that he is now plagued with these horrible thoughts and this terrible mental state. He says, only for them, and again, only for them showing that he is now loyal to the witches, that he is loyal to this supernatural force that has prophesied his ascension to king. And he's given my eternal jewel, given to the common enemy of man. So this shows that he's given his soul over to corruption. The common enemy of man is evil. His eternal jewel, that is his soul. You know, it's the thing that's going to last forever once he's dead, either in heaven or hell. So he's given that over to evil, showing even more corruption. Finally, within the soliloquy, he says, Come fate into the list and champion me to the utterance. This shows that he is now trusting fate over his friends. So he's trusting the witches over his king. He's trusting fate over his friends. He is behaving in an unchecked way. His ambition is unchecked and so... He is just doing what he wants now. Okay. So then the murderers arrive, whom Macbeth is going to try and convince to murder Duncan. And as we read through this, I want you to consider Macbeth as a masculine or feminine character. How is he becoming less honourable? How is he becoming more like Lady Macbeth? Okay, so, so to note, structurally, when the murderers arrive, Macbeth stops using Amit Pentameter to talk to lower characters. He actually talks in prose. This shows that he doesn't necessarily like these characters. He's not going to put on airs and graces. He's just going to talk to them in the way that they would talk to him. If you know what I mean? So, so he, he tries to convince them that Banquo was the person that arrested them initially. And Banquo is the person that they should have a grievance with, not himself. Uh, he talks about, um, know that it was he, to mean Banquo, uh, that put you so under fortune, to, to put you in bad luck, not our innocent self to mean Macbeth. He then talks about how they had been crossed, you know, in being arrested, which is ironic because Macbeth is actually crossing them right now by lying. We could assume that Macbeth was one of the people that resulted in them being arrested, considering that he was loyal to Duncan in the first place. And then he puts words in their mouth by asking them who was the person that put you in all the situation, and he says, thus did Banquo. This makes Macbeth like an informer. And consider, regarding gender, is that a very masculine thing or a very feminine thing? Is it masculine to go around uh, manipulating people with words? Particularly at this time, you know, Jacobean era, in the, in the medieval era when this play was set. 
no, no, that was not a very masculine thing to do. Uh, he then poses them this question, is basically this little speech here. Are you so good that you can forget about Banquo? You know, are you so good that you can put this betrayal from Banquo behind you? And here again, we're seeing Macbeth using words and rhetoric to manipulate them as Lady Macbeth did to him. This is then further developed by Macbeth questioning their gender. The first murderer, in the response to the idea of, you know, can you forget about Banquo, says, we are men. You know, this is an assertion of his gender and everything that goes with it. You know, violence goes with masculinity in this play. Revenge goes with masculinity in this play. But Macbeth replies with, I, in the catalogue, you go for men. So this is the idea that on paper you go for men, but what about the way that you behave? You know, he is challenging their masculinity just like Lady Macbeth, and in doing so hopefully spurring them on to commit violent acts. He then compares them to dogs, uh, which has a few connotations uh, around the violence and the aggression that dogs exhibit, but also I think this is a class thing. You know, they are of a lower class. Dogs are lower creatures. They are servants to man. These are going to be his servants. And he says, every one according to the gift which bounteous nature hath in him closed. Uh, and their gift is murder. He's saying that you should judge yourself by the gifts that you have. Well, these murderers clearly have a gift for committing murder and assassination. And then he further challenges their masculinity by saying, and so of men. Now, if you have a station in the file, not in the worst rank of manhood, say it. So if you have a position in manhood, if you are prepared to show your masculinity through the violence I'm asking you to commit. OK, so now here we have another word for murder. Remember, we are tracking these words for murder, thinking about the connotations around them. Where before Duncan's murder was described as an assassination, here Macbeth talks about Banquo's murder as execution. This shows that now the state is saying that it's okay to murder Banquo, because Macbeth himself is the state. Okay, so then Macbeth talks a little bit more about his mental state, uh, saying that he will feel ill as long as Banquo is alive, saying of himself, who are our health but sickly in his life, which in his death were perfect. So the, the idea that if Banquo were to die, he would feel perfect. OK, so then the murderers make a few comments around fate that I think are particularly interesting. These comments foreshadow Macbeth's mental state towards the end of the play. Uh, the, the second murderer says, I am reckless what I do to spite the world. So, so he doesn't care what he does as long as it ends up hurting the world in some way. The first murderer says, and I another, so weary with disasters, tugged with fortune, that I would set my life on any chance to mend it or be rid on it. So, so this is him putting his life in the hands of fate, but at the same time he's saying that his life is so bad that he would do anything that would improve it or result in him dying. And he believes here that murdering Banquo is going to help to improve his life. So going through this, as I said before, we need to consider how Macbeth kills has changed. Um, as you see here, sword in combat, this is the most masculine, the most honourable, knife in the sleep, and now he's sending assassins. So, so just be aware of that. You know, that, that is a, a great way to talk about how Macbeth changes across this play. So, so now Macbeth switches back to Ambit Pentameter. He stops talking in prose and moves back to Ambit Pentameter. This is to do with control. He's trying to control the situation by showing his higher class way of talking. Um, this could be his passion, that he's talking about something he's so passionate about he can't help but slip back into this Ambit Pentameter. But likewise, the return to Ambit Pentameter could be to assert his social position and to remind the murderers that he is their superior. So then he talks about Banquo being his enemy. He says, so he is mine and in such bloody distance. So bloody here, I think, refers to anger. You know, if we're thinking about the symbolism around blood and how that symbolism changes, here it could be anger, um, it could be violence, um, it could be distance in time. 
the blood of the kings of the future belongs to Banquo, you know. Uh, so, so bearing in mind, blood could mean lots and lots of different things. Macbeth says that he could, with bare-faced power, sweep him from my sight. This is Macbeth's control of the situation. This is Macbeth's power. You know, that now that he is king, he's able to do whatever he likes. This also would be an example of Macbeth's unchecked ambition, that he could easily just kill Banquo, and there's not anything that anybody could do. However, however, he recognises that there would be consequences to this action. But Macbeth understands that he can't just kill Banquo, because he and Banquo have friends and allegiances that he really wants to keep. So in the same way that he did with Duncan, Macbeth says that he must wail his fall who I myself struck down. He's saying here that he needs to appear saddened by the death of Banquo, even though he was the one that killed him. This is just like Duncan. You know, this is exactly the same as Duncan, where he says, false face must hide what the false heart doth know. This is another false face of Macbeth. He's going to put a false face on to appear saddened by the death of Banquo, uh, masking the business from the common eye. Again, you know, he wants to hide his betrayal of Banquo from the common eye by pretending to be really sad about it. Uh, the murders then agree to do what Macbeth is asking them to do. And Macbeth says, your spirit shine through you. This is a piece of ambiguous language here. Uh, your spirits... He doesn't indicate whether they are good spirits or bad spirits. It has connotations around witchcraft, you know, and controlling through the supernatural. Uh, and finally, you know, evil. Uh, Lady Macbeth says, if you remember, come ye spirits who tend on mortal thoughts. You know, ghosts, things for the afterlife. These are all linked with satanic imagery uh, and evil at the end of the day. Uh, he then talks about fleance using a euphemism, absence, to mean his death, you know, um, and that he must embrace the fate of that dark hour, that Fleance and Banquo must embrace what is coming for them. And finally, Macbeth ends this scene reflecting on Banquo's situation. He said it is concluded, Banquo, thy soul's flight, if it find heaven, must find it out tonight. So, so this heroic couplet talks about control, uh, it talks about Macbeth being powerful in the situation. However, however, this mirrors Duncan's death heroic couplet, you know, um, uh, and this mirrors Duncan's death heroic couplet uh, in Act 2, Scene 1, when Macbeth says, Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. If you remember, there was an ambiguity behind that statement that Duncan was either a good king or a bad king. Now, in this instance, Macbeth lacks the hell element. He says, if it find heaven, must find it out tonight. He knows that Banquo is going to go to heaven because Banquo is pure and Banquo would make a good king. All of this linking to directly talking to James I, who it was said descended from the line of Banquo. So bear in mind, when Shakespeare writes the prophecy for Banquo, that he will father kings, who will then father a line of kings, this is talking to King James. He is one of the children of Banquo. And by saying that Banquo will have a long line of kings, he's saying King James will have a long line of kings. By saying that Banquo is going to go to heaven, he's saying that King James is going to go to heaven. Okay? Right. So that is at 3, scene 1. I hope you found it useful. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye.